Shmini. Moshe Rabbeinu, in the past seven days, began every day erecting the Mishkan, dismantling it, officiating as if he would be the Kohen. On the eighth day, Aaron and his children were installed to be the Kohanim on a permanent level. Aaron, the Kohen Rodel, the high priest, the sons, the Sagani Kohen Rodel, the assistant high priests. On the eighth day, Moshe called Aaron and his sons and the Zikna Yisrael and the elders of Yisrael. If we would be choosing the person who's most qualified to be the Kohen Gadol, who would we choose? Moshe. Moshe Rabbeinu. Yeah, Moshe Rabbeinu wasn't chosen to be the high priest. Why? Because initially at the burning bush, when Hashem had some, some to be the Goel, the Redeemer, and he was in the dialogue for seven days, and after Hashem answered every reason why he's the most qualified, he says, but why don't you send it, send the person who's your ordinary agent, your regular agent, Aaron. Hashem became angry, and the response was, initially you should have been the Kohen Gadol, now you will be the Levi, your brother will be the Kohen. So because of this, although he did it for the sake of although he had done it for the sake of humility, for the sake of humility, that he felt he may be offending his elder brother, nevertheless it was considered a disrespect, and therefore he forfeited priesthood, not only for himself, for his children. When a person realizes that he no longer has a right, which is the ultimate right, to be the efficient of Hashem, and you have to be the one to install him, and install him in a way where it's uncontested, irrefutably, in place, irretractable, that your brother will be the Kohen Godel, you will never be the Kohen Godel. Your children will never be Kohanim. It's not an easy matter. But yet over here, Hashem calls to Moshe, and Moshe appoints Aaron and his sons and Zikna Yisrael. So we have three settings. The Orachim Kodesh points this out. Firstly, it was Kora Moshe La'aron Ulebonov. Sometimes something which is painful, even if you have to do it, you do it just in one swoop, just get it over with. First he went and installed Aaron. Then he installed his children. One after another. And he did it in a public setting with the Zikna Yisrael. It was done in the presence of all the elders of Israel. So therefore, it's irretractable. Once this is done, how does a person do such a thing? It's not simple. And he did it without any hesitation. As painful as something may be, but if a person understands that whatever he does and he lives every fiber of his existence is purely for the sake of Hashem. Moshe Rabbeinu was the only human being ever, who ever lived, who was totally negated to Hashem. There wasn't a trace of self. If that's the will of God, that's the will of God. So by the Torah telling us Moshe is able to do this, that only reveals and tells us where is Moshe at? What place is he? That is his place. Anybody would have had a self of self, sense of self, it would have been too difficult to do this. Therefore, it's only because he's Moshe, Moshe is able to do Aaron, Bonov, Ulzikne Yisrael, to do in the presence of all the elders of Israel for that reason. As I mentioned the other week, we find that Moshe did not participate in the Binyan Mishkan, building of the Mishkan. Neither initially did the princes, the Nisim. And the Nisim, why did they not participate initially? Because they said, let everybody else have the opportunity, and whatever is missing, lacking, we'll fill in. And what happened? They, ne they nearly missed the boat. By the time they realized, there was, there was nearly nothing left to do. And therefore, it's ri written, Nisim is written deficient. The Yud is deleted. 
to indicate that the behavior is not acceptable. We find that they donated the precious stones, but where are the precious stones listed? After all the other materials, we speak about the precious stones. It had the least value to Hashem, regardless of the material value, but because of how they came about, it had the least amount of value. The precious stones that were used in the Choshen. Because this atzlu, because it's attributed to laziness. Moshe Rabbeinu did not participate in the Mishkan. Why? Because Moshe said, let every Jew have the opportunity to be participate in the Mishkan. And if I participate, I may deny another Jew his right to participate. Whatever, whatever is lacking, I will fill in. Hashem extols him, praises him for this selfless level of dedication to Klal Yisrael. Here he's reprimanding the Nisim for saying these words. And he says the exact words verbatim, and he's praising him, extolling him. You're one of a kind of a person. So how, how do we differentiate? So what we had said was, the Nisim, anybody who has a sense of self, who has a self-interest, it is impossible with such an opportunity, if you truly appreciate that opportunity, that you shouldn't be there immediately. Why weren't they immediate? Why weren't they there immediately? The answer is Nisatslu, because they were laid back. They didn't fully appreciate the value, therefore they were laid back. Moshe Rabbeinu, who there's no trace of self, he has a sense of self, but what's the sense of self? His value is only Hashem. Kovat Shemayim, what's God's glory? So God's glory is every Jew should participate. Therefore, by saying that's the reason why I did not participate, this is something which is praiseworthy. Identically, Moshe Rabbeinu be Moshe Rabbeinu. Therefore, for him, it's not difficult. Only because he's Moshe, therefore he can install Aaron, Bonov, in the presence, in a public setting, which is Zikne Yisrael, that's what the Torah is attesting to. It's interesting, Rashi says, why is it done before the elders of Israel? That the only reason why Aaron is qualified is because it's through divine dictate that he's able to officiate as the high priest. He's not going to say he forced himself in. He took the position. He grabbed the position. Okay? Now, first of all, how does that say that? It was Alpi Adibor. What was Alpi Adibor? Because Moshe Rabbeinu, his word is synonymous with the word of Hashem. So it's not he put himself in that place and therefore now his brother didn't want to oust him. He was only put there because Moshe put him there. And who's Moshe? Moshe is Alpi Hashem. Okay, now we have a little bit of a problem. But what happens if you question what's Moshe's qualification to install him? Right? And that happened later with, 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 with Korach. He claimed it in nepotism. See, right now there's no question Aaron did not grab it. Because how did he arrive there? It was witness, Moshe installed him. So it's not something he, he seized. He seized the opportunity. But Korach, he went to the root of the issue. It's true. He didn't seize it. But why was he there? Nepotism. It's not the word of Hashem, it's the word of Moshe. So he says, you know, I have a claim against all this. Moshe Rabbeinu is not qualified to make that decision. This is his own decision. It's not God's decision. Of course, if it's based on qualification, I'm more qualified than Aaron for that reason. It's a beautiful Orchaim Akkadosh here points out, Gemara tells us in Rosh Hashanah that we find that the high priest who officiates on Yom Kippur, there's two services. There's the service on the outer part of the Beis Amikdosh or the outer area, which is called the courtyard area, and then there's the inner service, which is 
has to do with the Holy of Holies. The service for the outside service, which he does all year, he wears his regular vestments, which are eight vestments, which are gold vestments. The service, which is particular to Yom Kippur, he only wears four vestments made of linen. No gold. Why no gold? Because what does gold represent? It represents the Chet Egel, the golden calf. And we have a principle, in Kategel Nasan Heger, that a prosecutor cannot be an advocate. You know, it's interesting, there's halocha, that is min gashkenaz, custom of Ashkenazim, that an ovel, person who's a mourner, doesn't daven for the omud on Shabbos and Yom Tif. Doesn't. What's the reason? Now, a person, whether he's during the 30 days, or if God forbid a person lost a parent during the year, regardless of why the person passed away, the relatives who remain, it's considered that the attribute of justice is on the family. They're under God's scrutiny for a year. That's the reason. So as a result of that, when you have an advocate, which is called a shlich tzibur, a representative of the community, who supplicates Hashem on your behalf, you want him to be a proper advocate. So Shabbos and Yom Tif, which is midas arachmim, you don't want a person who has midas adin upon him to be your advocate when midas arachmim is, is in full force. So therefore, that's the reason why the Ovel is not a proper advocate on Shabbos and Yom Tif. Because of the degree of rachmim that exists on Shabbos and Yom Tif, he doesn't qualify to be the Shlir Tzibur for that reason. It's the same, it's, 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 it's within the semblance of Enka Tegen Nasan Hager. He's under a different level of scrutiny. As a result of that, he's not qualified. You have no choice. He, he's the Shlir Tzibur if you have no one else qualified. But if you have an alternative, you seek an alternative. Gold is unacceptable in the inner sanctums of the Beis Hamidosh or the Mishkan. And Kategas Nasus and Hager. The Golden Calf is the greatest prosecutor. And we once mentioned, it says that Ubiyo Pokti Ufakarati, that on the day that you will be punished for any sin, part of that punishment will be the sin of the Golden Calf. Why? I mean, God forgave us, right? He says, V'salachti, I forgave you. So why does Hashem say to Moshe, Ubiyom pokti, when I will take, make the reckoning, Ufakarati, the reckoning of the gold calf will be included in that reckoning in terms of punishment. Why? Now, we had mentioned in the morning, Avodah Zorah tells us that if not for the Chet Egel, the Jews would have reverted back before the sin of Adam. That means they would have lived eternally. If that is the case, the whole concept of sin had no relevance to Klal Yisrael. Now they failed with the Chet Egel, with this golden calf. What happens? They revert back to post-sin. Post-sin, now you're vulnerable to sin. So the need for Kapora, the need for atonement, is why? It's because the Chet Egel. So the Chet Egel is a directly linked to every time you transgress. The only reason why you transgress is because we reverted back to post-sin of Adam. So therefore the Kohen Gadol, the high priest who he enters into the Holy Holies to supplicate Hashem for the ultimate forgiveness. He should come with gold there. The gold is the cause why you need Kapora. The culprit is here. The culprit, the reason why God's name was desecrated at some level, whether it was deliberate, inadvertent, whatever it was, is because the gold, golden calf. So to come with something which is representative of the golden calf, gold vestments, it's unacceptable. Therefore, it's only the outer service, not the inner service, cannot be done with gold vestments based on the principle of an ad, uh, a prosecutor cannot be an advocate for that reason. That's the understanding. Now, we find that Hashem says that what is the korban, the sacrifice of Aaron? Kach lecho egel. Ben boke lechatos. Take for yourself, for him, a calf for a sin offering. But when it says el b'nei Yisrael, to dabnet kuh sir izim lechatos. You take a goat. 
not a calf. Eagle, the calf is from the Shona or Tmin The eagle, the calf, could be for the burnt offering, but not for the sin offering. Aaron, it's even for the sin offering. So, and Rashi says, why does he bring the Egel? That the reason why he brings an Egel is to atone for the Egel that he had made. And Klal Yisrael, why don't they bring an Egel? Because in Kateg Nasa Neger. So the question is, if we're saying that for Klal Yisrael, it can be brought as a sin offering, because a prosecutor can be an advocate, so Aaron, who he needs the eagle to atone for him, for, for, for his association with the Chet Egel, why could he bring the eagle, the calf, as an atonement? We should say to apply the same principle, and Kateg Nasan a prosecutor can be an advocate. So Rechaim HaKadosh makes a differentiation. Klaus believed that because Moshe passed away, they needed an intermediary. And they wanted, although they didn't initiate it, it was initiated by the rabble, by the Erev Rav, but factually they were drawn into this. And so what was their sin? Their sin was actually the Egel Hazov. That the Egel had value. It had value as a deity. And they wanted a deity to intervene on their behalf. So if that's the case, the Egel is what represents the deity. That cannot be an advocate. The prosecutor cannot be an advocate. Now, what was Aaron's participation in the Egel? The gathering of the gold. Nothing beyond that. Of course, he thought. He never believed in the Egel. He believed Moshe would return until they all give the gold. But factually speaking, Aaron deliberately collected the gold. What followed was beyond his control. It was inadvertent. So as a result of this, the gold itself, there was a deliberate intent. Although he didn't believe it would evolve to be what it was. So therefore, in the inner sanctums, gold is not acceptable. Even for the high priest to have gold. But in terms of your personal atonement, kapora, you could bring an eagle. Of course, the eagle, as an eagle, you were never involved with eagle. He was never involved with the, the calf as, as, an, as a deity. But the, the gathering gold, that was deliberate. That's Enkatek and Asenegos. So the gold vestments for the coin Godol, the coin Godol, the high priest cannot go into the end of sanctums to do that service. The outer part, that, that he could. That's how he differentiates. Now, why do we bring all these various sacrifices? Moshe Rabbeinu says to, to the, the Klal Yisrael, Ki yom Hashem nire alechem. Because today God will appear to you. As it says later, the fire came down from heaven, they all prostrated themselves, and they sang the praises of Hashem. That's why you, might, you must be qualified through these karbonos that the Shechina, the Divine Presence, should descend into the Mishkan. So Rashi says something which seems to be unclear. That his shechino, that his divine presence, should dwell in your handiwork. Therefore, these karbonos are obligatory on this day. That through the karbonos you'll be worthy that the divine presence should dwell on your handiwork. What's your handiwork? The mishkan. The mishkan is your handiwork. So the medium is the karbonos, and ultimately the divine presence will dwell, okay? So the Sif makes a point, that's the commentator on Rashi, that we find earlier that God's glory entered into the Mishkan, even before, even before this moment. Not only that, we find Kvod Hashem comes about even when the Jews sinned. The Kvod Hashem came in the midst. So what does it mean? It means, he explains... That the Shechina descends into the Mishkan is an, a confirmation, indication of that excessive love that Hashem has for us 
that he accepted our kabbonos. I mean, he accepted that service. He accepted the gift. I mentioned, the Gemara tells us in Kedushin, that if a man marries a woman, he, the Torah says, Kikach ish ish. a man must give the object of value to the woman in marriage. What happens if a woman gives the object of value to the husband, the respective husband, and the husband says, you're married to me with the object that you gave me. Ain't a good She's not married. Because the man, Torah says, Kiach Ishisha. The man must give the object of value to the woman. What about if we have a person, he's classified as Odom Choshuf. Because of his stature, it's beneath his dignity to accept gifts from anyone. And if he accepts a gift from anyone, the person prides himself, the giver prides himself that this person was agreeable to accept the gift from him. The person is honored. So the woman gives a gift to such a person and the person who receives the gift says, you married to me with my receiving of the gift. That means the honor that you received from me, you should be married to me. She's married. Why? Because he's not marrying her with the gift that he received, but it's the honor that he had given her by agreeable to accept the gift. Because that tells us that he values her. And to indicate that, that has value. That has financial value. Monetary value. She's Mekudeshis. We bring Karbonos to Hashem. Hashem could have turned his back on the Karbonos. Could have. We bring these sacrifices. The Divine Presence descends. A fiery ball comes in. Which indicates the Shekhinah accepted them. What does that say? That means he values our service. Valuing our service is special. That demonstrates Chiba Yaseiro and accepts excessive level of love which he's displaying to us. We know we're in. Otherwise he wouldn't do such a thing. We find by Cain and Hevel, Cain and Abel, they both bore Karbonos. Cain, who initiated bringing the Karbon, the sacrifice, Torah says he brought from the dregs of the earth. He brought a flax plant. Hashem turned, did not pay attention to it, did not turn to it. Hevel, Abel, brought Michel V'yatzon from the fattest choices of a sheep and as Hashem turned towards that carbon and consumed it. He, the other one he rejected. So just because you bring a sacrifice, an offering, doesn't mean to say that you're necessarily in good standing with Hashem. So that that the Shekhinah descended is an indication that what? That the, so the objective is so it doesn't mean the Shekhinah should dwell. That once we're in, we're in. When Moshe Rabbeinu says to us, Bonam Lashem you're God's children. Are you his child today? You're not his child tomorrow. Once you're a child, you're a child. Right? You're a child. This is an indication that Hashem accepted you. He established you as his people. The Sephardim learns differently than Rashi. In the past, we already see the Mishkan was built. Initially, the Shechina was came within us, as it says. This is in Shmos. The glory of Hashem filled the Mishkan. It's appropriate to honor him with a korban because of what he did for us. A person does multiple things to you, for you, on your behalf. So you show a degree of appreciation, respect, by some level of reciprocation. Not that the recipient needs, needs whatever you have, but to show that you value what he has done for you. So bringing the korban now is an indication of what Hashem has done for us. And where do we see Hashem accepted that? Because this is the Shechina that came down, that that was accepted. We find that Dovid Mel says in Tilim, Shivisi Hashem Negdi Tomid that God was always before David's eyes. He always felt that he was in the presence of God. You know, a person 
We speak about, the Gemara speaks about, a person can do a mitzvah lishma for the sake of the mitzvah. A person does a mitzvah with an ulterior motive, as it says, for financial gain, for acknowledgement, that's shlo lishma. But lishma means I'm doing for the sake of a mitzvah, <coughs> at the various levels of for the sake of What about a person does it, not only does, it, he, do, does he do it for the sake of God, he feels privileged and he feels uh, ecstatic because he feels by doing the mitzvah, he's serving God in this moment. He feels he's standing in the presence of God doing the mitzvah. It's another level. When David did the mitzvah, he felt he was always in the presence of God. There was always a consciousness that he's standing, he felt God's presence. Could you imagine every Jew, if you'd feel God's presence, every moment you do, when you, do, when you put on your tefillin, you feel honored that in his presence you should put on the tefillin to show the os al yodecho totof has been This is the ultimate level. So what Moshe Rabbeinu said to Klaus Yisrael, ke yom Hashem nira aleichem, because God will be coming upon you, this is what you have to do if you achieve that level of cognizance of God's presence in your life, then you merit everything. <clears throat> because Moshe says, V'yomem Moshe, Zeh HaDover, Shetziv Hashem Tasu, Zeh HaDover. And if you do that, V'yer Alechem Kvod Hashem, then the glory of God will come upon you. Now, the Gemara says that there's no separation between us and God. The only separation is there's a mechitza shel barzel. What is, there's an iron curtain separating us from God. That's avonoseinu, our sins. That's the only thing that separates us from Hashem. You know, a person goes into the water with a wetsuit, you don't feel the water. So if you have enough coating of impurity, that creates this barrier between you and Hashem creates an unworthiness. But what if you strip away that barrier? And all there is, you and Hashem, then there's no, there's no interference. You get cleave to Hashem. Zeh dover, meaning if, zeh, if this is what you come upon, this understanding, this level of cognizance which God commanded you. And what was that? As we said earlier, you're bringing this carbon lefnei Hashem, and Hashem is accepting your carbon, and that's what what you do. Then the year Hashem. Then God's presence will come upon you. You know, it's interesting, the halacha is that a, a Jew is not circumcised. As an adult, he's liable for kores. It's very serious, although it's only a positive commandment. Positive commandments, you never find this liability of spiritual excision, only for certain negative commandments. But there's two positive commandments, although you're violating them passively, you're not fulfilling them, you have a liability of kores. One is the Korm Pesach, Paschal lamb, a Jew can, is qualified to bring the Korm Pesach on Pesach on the 14th and eat it on the 15th, does not, he's liable for spiritual excision. And a Jew who can have himself circumcised as an adult and does not, he's liable for spiritual excision. Now, what, ex what is spiritual excision? The Torah always says it's being you cut off from God. But whenever the Torah speaks about being cut off from God, it says, you cut off from your people. You cut off from the, from the Jews. From, from, either from your people or me Israel. What exactly? We had mentioned in the name, it cited the name of the, the Zohar, that when Hashem originally created Odom, He was created without a foreskin. Where did the foreskin come from? The foreskin itself was an expression of the evil of Deitz Hadas. It's a covering. What, what is evil? Evil distorts truth 
And even what's evil appears to be attractive, attractive and positive. It's a distortion of reality. That's what evil is. We find that Esau, who is the personification, Edom, of evil, what was his primary attribute or characteristic? Deception. Lavan was Arami. Ravan was, 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 was a charlatan. He was black, but he called himself Lavan. White as a lily, right? Lavan. But he couldn't keep pace with, with Esau. Esau outpaced him endless times over. What is that? Because again, that's evil. Evil is the distortion of truth. That was Esau. He deceived his father. He asked him, could you, could you tithe straw? Could, do you tithe salt? His father thought he was a great tzaddik, but this was all deception, okay? So what is the force, of what does it represent? It represents the unadulterated evil. It's the expression of the, the Ra of the Eitzadas. Something of that, there's a posuk in Tilim, it says, Lo yigor ra. Hashem will not associate within his, uh, within his proximity anything that represents Ra. Anything that's truly evil, so therefore it says, the verse says, shakronim. A group of people who are actually pathological liars. Liars. God wants nothing to do with them. Because what's sheker? Sheker is rah. If if the signet of God is truth, he wants nothing to do with, with what? Something which is lies. Okay? That represents evil. It's contrary to truth. So if the foreskin itself is the expression of that evil, that's when we cut it away. Therefore, God says, I have nothing to do with that person. I have nothing to do with that person. We find that the Yitzhahara, it says when the Sheikh will come, it says, um, es orlas God says, I will circum circumcise the covering on your heart. So the Ramban explains what does that mean? At the end of time, come Mashiach, it says, quotes a posuk, the verse says, a spirit of purity will come upon the earth and cleanse the world of evil. There'll be a ruach taro, a spirit of purity. Then a person will no longer crave to do, to steal anything which is contrary to Kedusha. Nobody will have any relevance to that any longer. So as there's an evil, so the evil has touched and tainted every human being. And the reason, as you have a foreign substance in your system, you crave that substance, like Chas Shalom, a drug addict, every human being being tainted with the evil of the Eitz Adas, we crave at some level. There's a craving. Because that substance, that, that's the Orlas Levavchim. That's the covering on our heart. Because the heart is desire, emotion, that's what it is, and that's where it all stems from. So if a person is able to achieve that shivisi Hashem Megdi Tomit, that despite being a human mortal who is a descendant of Odom, and you're able to have a sense of God, despite that, then you qualify, the Shekhinah should come upon you. So when the Shekhinah came based on Migdash, the Jews were able to achieve that level of cognizance, of feeling, and because of that, the Shekhinah did, did descend. But if the Jews themselves wouldn't have that purity of heart, it wouldn't have happened. There's a famous Arachayim Kodesh we always speak about. It's interesting. The Rabban says, and other commentators say, what is the concept of korban? sacrifice. The whole concept of sacrifice is Midas Arachmi. It's the attribute of miracle. says, Korban Lashem. A person inadvertently violates Shabbos. What should be? Should be put to death. Why should be put to death? You say, it's only inadvertent. What happens if a person ingests something bacterial which is fatal? Did he, did he intend to? Doesn't, but if you ingest something which is, which is infected infectious waste which has enough to kill a thousand people you understand you're not surviving it whether you did it deliberately inadvertently doesn't make a difference so when you sin even inadvertently 
You shouldn't survive it. Hashem came up with a formula. It's called Korban Lashem. If you bring a sacrifice that meets the criteria which Hashem set forth, species, unblemished, efficient, and so on and so forth, that sacri- and you have a certain mindset that you do tshuva, and you have a mind that you want the animal, and you visualize that the animal should, is the equivalent of yourself, you should have been slaughtered, your blood should have been sprinkled, you should deserve to be burnt, it's only due to rachme Hashem, to God's mercy that not, then you're fully atoned. You're fully reinstated. Okay? That is the concept of korban. The korban is in place of the person. Hashem is willing to accept the sacrifice placed in the person, that's why the person is fully atoned. Okay? So Rechaim HaKadosh asks a question. He's quoted God swore that He will establish the world and His creations within the context of judgment, justice. Anybody says Hashem is willing to look away, His life should be compromised because that's contrary to justice. Im Cain. If a person truly, who sins, he deserves to die, as the Novi says, So how do we bring a carbon somehow and this absolves us from death? The carbon's not the antidote. So if you deserve to die, why don't you die? How do you take an animal in the place of the person? She so says something beautiful. We mentioned this in the past, but it's worthwhile to repeat. The Gemara tells us, Chazal tell us, A person does not sin unless some level of foolishness, temporary insanity entered into his mind. So when a person sins, is he fully using his faculty of intellect? Being a rational, stable person? The answer is no. Because if a person would understand the con- think about the consequences of the sin, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. So it has to be meaning the conflicts, the desire, the craving causes the person to be off balance and because you're off balance, therefore you make this kind of decision. That's the basis. It's Ruchstus. Now, how do you differentiate between an animal and a human being? Intelligence. Right? The faculty of intelligence. Animal has no intelligence. Everything is what? Is instinctive. A human being is decision making. Make a decision based on the intellect. He says, when a person sinned, does he sin as an animal or does he sin as a human being with an intellect? It's only the physicality of the person. Instinctively, he was drawn to do that because of his conflicts. So now, when he brings the carbon, he has to do tshuva. He repents. He says vidu. He has confession. That means now bringing the carbon, he's fully engaged in the intellect. So how do you take a person who's an intellectual being for the behavior of an animal? It's not, that's not justice. As a result of that, Hashem says, bring an animal in place of the animal. However, there has to be some level of, of equivalent, of equity over here. What is it? The answer is, the person, no question, if he has no remorse and no pain for the pleasure that he had when he sinned uh, inadvertently, you can't bring the animal. So if it's a combination of the animal with remorse and committing yourself to you're never going to repeat it again, Hashem, that's mishpat. That's, that's, that's justice. That's justice. Because ju- it would be an injustice to take a human being for the behavior of an animal. He says, and that's what David means in Tilim. We say every, every after Mincha on Shabbos, Adam u Behema Toshi Hashem. Adam the man and the Behema Toshi Hashem. Hashem will assist. What does that mean? The human being is a composite of the animal with, with the intellect. The human being, through the animal and through his intellect, Hashem will allow salvation to come about. But it's a combination of both. To bring the animal without tshuva means nothing. 
Without remorse, it means nothing. To, to have remorse without the animal means nothing. So it's a combination of both. The animal together with the person. Pirushal litzido adei shlo yeonesh v'en roi leonesh. Ubezeh afilu bedin hakrovza korban barachet shukav mishpot. So therefore you need the Odom together with the animal to bring about the Yeshua, the salvation. That's the principle. find, this is what we read on Yom Kippur, that the suit of the day of the inauguration, the installation of Aaron Bonov, the most two special sons of Aaron, was struck down by God, because they brought in Eish Zorah. This was the eighth day, and they were the future leaders of Klal Yisrael, not of Enaviyu. They were struck down, why? Because they brought an alien fire. So the question is, what exactly did they do wrong? They should have consulted with Moshe, and they did not. And as a result of that, it was unacceptable what they did. Therefore, they deserve to die. Okay? So Moshe says to Aaron, I knew there was going to be, somebody's life was going to be taken. On the day of the installa- on the day that the Mishkan took on its permanent level, when the Shechina, when the Divine Presence would enter. Initially, I questioned whether it's me, you, or I, because they didn't fool themselves who they were. But now I see it was your sons. Why? Because Hashem told me initially, Bekrove Akodesh. Through those who are closer to me, I will be sanctified. So initially, I thought we were greater than they are. But now I see they are greater than we are. I mean, none of you were greater than Moshe and Aaron. Definitely not. There was no Jew greater than Moshe Rabbeinu. He says, initially, I thought we were greater than they, but since Hashem says, with those who are close to me, I will sanctify it, therefore, that confirms they were greater than us. And what were the greater than us? So, Ramir Simple of Vince explains that none of you, this was their only sin. What do we learn from this? We learn from this, you'd say, person sins has one sin. Hashem looks away. But looking away and not bringing that person to justice is not justice. Even though it's one infraction, it doesn't make a difference. The person has to be punished. That's, otherwise, it's not justice. So people have multiple sins. Moshe had other sins. Aaron had sins. But you say they have the least. So if they be taken, that would prove this point. What about if you have someone who has only one sin? This was their only sin. So this point of Krovi Kodesh, those who are close to me, I was sanctified to show that Hashem does look, Hashem is, is the Diana Emes. That tr- truthful justice is, Hashem is minor as the record may be, the record has to be audited. So therefore, that that they would take proves that that was their only sin. We, we may be great in the totality of it, but in terms of to communicate this point, it's clear that they are greater than we are. Because they could be used as, the, as that example, which we couldn't be used as that example. So it says, Vayido Maron. Aaron remained silent. I mean, what do you mean we're saying? He remained silent. Evidently, he, he was like put into shock. None of you, his most two special sons, should be taken. It's something, to, uh, humanly, it's nearly impossible to deal with. Torah says, and Torah makes it a point. Vayido Maron. Aaron remained silent. So what does it tell me? Even for our own, it wasn't simple to remain silent. What do you mean it's not simple to remain silent? How, how is it not simple? I mean, you're questioning Hashem's not dying in MS. I mean, Vayidomar, what should he say? The moment the person says, why did it happen? It's a problem. What do you mean, why did it happen? It happened. If Hashem's dying in MS, that's why it happened. Do we understand why it happened? We may not understand. Why did Hashem have to have it? do it this way? We don't understand that. 
But if Hashem is dying or MS, he's the true judge, what do you mean why? There's no basis for the question. So why does the Torah have to go out of its way and say, Vayido Maron, he remained silent. Torah is making it a point. So the Sephardo says something over here. It says, when Moshe Rabbeinu explained to him that he knew it was going to happen, because Hashem had said that only on the day that I will establish myself on a permanent basis, your mitz, I will be sanctified, and I will take those who are closest to me, that was a nechama. He remained silent. The Torah revealed to him that he, he, he was consoled. It wasn't only he was, wasn't paid. Of course, chasham, he wouldn't question. But what about to be consoled? Consoled is more than not questioning. He was consoled, meaning he saw the value of his children being taken. That's, that's, that's what it means by Yudu Maron. That's what the Torah is revealing. That's the Sephardo. But factually, it's, a, it's an explicit Midrash. The Midrash says, A fire came out before, from before God and it consumed them. They died before Hashem. But Moshe Vomal Aaron, Excuse me. Where did Hashem say, Are we sanctified with those who are closest to me? But Midbar Sinai, it says, V'noarti shomel of Nesho, V'nigdashti, V'nigdash b'chvodi. I will be sanctified b'chvodi. V'cheno m'mosh l'aron, Ho'ez shomel li b'chrovei ha-kodesh, Ho'shavti. When Hashem originally said, I will be sanctified to those who are closest to me, I thought, Ki b'o b'cho yifka, Would it be me or you? Would be the ones to be taken, To bring about this Kiddush Hashem. V'achshva n'yodea kem g'dolim m'meni m'mcho. Now I know they are greater than us. V'yidom aron, he remained silent. It was a consolation. So, not chas v'shom Torah tell me he didn't complain. How could he complain? Right? But rather, it was a consolation. He saw the value. We say dynamis. Do we understand what dynamis is? We accept it. Do we understand why this is just, whatever Hashem, Hashem is, is the true judge? That's it. Whatever he decides, that's truth. Do we understand why? We don't understand why. We just accept it. But here he understood. Aaron understood it was a true consolation for him. That his children were so special. They had no other sin other than this. To bring about that ultimate Kiddush Hashem. Bekrovei HaKodesh. So it's interesting. We find. Nadav and Aviyu. It says in the Medrash. In Chazal. They deserve to die a Kabbal Satora. Because at Kabbal Satorah, when the Shekhinah came, they were in a place, they looked directly at the Shekhinah. And they should have turned away. So that, that they looked directly at the Divine Presence, was considered a disrespect. Like Lahavdu, today, you know, people, when they do a deal, they look them in the eye, you know? Who stares down who? Well, that, it's, a, it's, 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 it's a ploy, it's a game, right? That shows, you know, you're in a position of strength that... When a Kodesh Baruch Hu, you know, you have to be there with humility. You can't look God in the eye, Kavi You can't look at the Shekhinah. So that did he looked at Shekhinah directly, together with the Zekanim, together with Zekanim, they all deserve to die. So why did they die then? So the Medjur says, because since there was Simcha Satorah, there was joy that we've taken as Jewish people, Hashem didn't want to intermingle tragedy at such a joyous moment. So he delayed it until now. So they were taken now. Now, how did the, the Zikanim who were there, or the Nasi, how, where did, how, when did they perish? They perished with the story with Slav. When they complained that they didn't have any meat and they ate the quail, it says they died. That's when they died. So what was the value of their death? They were brushed under the carpet and forgotten about. Even though not in view, they deserved to die, but what was the value of their death? Because how special they were, they brought about this ultimate Kiddush Hashem that Hashem does not look away, is as clean as the reckon may be. Even for one infraction, Hashem will not look away and Hashem will impose justice. Therefore, they were used as the example. So when it, Moshe says, I thought it would be either I or you because we have the, the best record, evidently they have a better record and therefore they are a better example of this concept of Dayon or Ebes. Okay.